Hello, Clement 29 here with another Topic of the Week video. This week, I'm a bit late. I know. I'm getting around to it. This week is going to be talking about rewriting The Force Awakens as the final topic for Star Wars Month. This week's topic was submitted by Tumblr and On, and their topic is How would you rewrite The Force Awakens? What will you change? What would you keep? Are there any elements from the old EU that you would add, or would you just scrap all that stuff entirely? Actually, there are a number of elements that I would keep from the old EU. Just a few. Because, well, the old EU was kind of a mess. Let's be perfectly honest. The new EU, it's a mess. The old EU has a lot of stuff that we like, but it's also got some stupid stuff. And it even takes some of the good stuff and ruins it. Like Mara Jade. Oh, we love Mara Jade. Hey, we killed her off. Oh. Yeah. But I would keep some of this stuff. And I've talked about this before, how there are good ideas in the old EU, but what it needed was focus, control, which is what Disney promised us with the new EU. We've got a whole story group. Oh, wait, what's that? The people in the story group aren't even interested in Star Wars? I'm sure, that, I'm sure they're perfect for looking over canon. Yeah. That's how we ended up in this mess in the first place. Now, talking about rewriting The Force Awakens is an interesting topic. I've actually come up with several variants of a rewrite. Um, a couple of years ago, I actually put together a full, like, run-through of the entire movie of how I would rewrite it. Now, since then, I've changed my ideas on a few things. And for the sake of time, I won't be going through the entire movie because this video would be like two hours if I went through and explained everything that I would change in the movie because holy crap, there are good ideas in The Force Awakens, but the movie, the movie is a complete mess. So like with my Kylo Ren video, I'll be going over a lot of the main stuff at it. I'll be going over the characters and how I would handle them, the, the general story, so to cover the main important things. So I won't be going beat for beat over the entire movie. Now first I want to talk about what I will keep from The Force Awakens. I'll keep most of the main cast. Rey, Finn, Poe, Kylo Ren. And I talked about Kylo Ren in my previous video. So I won't be going in depth with talking about him here. But I'll just I'll reference his character. So if you want to know more about the way I handle Kylo Ren, you can check out my video on rewriting Kylo Ren. I'll keep the same general setup. It's 30 years after Return of the Jedi. The First Order exists. Now, the important thing that I'm changing is context and the backstory. So that stuff sort of cascades and has a domino effect where it starts affecting things further down the line. So all the mistakes that were made in The Force Awakens with how they set it up and fixing that. And once you've fixed that, you have a much stronger foundation to build the rest of a story for a trilogy off of. First off, let me talk about Rey. Rey will be very similar to her canon counterpart. She will be a scavenger on Jakku, a sand planet, and I know it's very similar to Tatooine, but I'm sure there are plenty of sand planets, and, you know, we will go with this. I will still keep the backstory of the Battle of Jakku, which is the last major battle between what was left of the Empire and the Rebellion. Only this time, you'll actually learn about it in the movie. Because there is an old man who lives on Jakku who actually was there for a lot of this stuff. So he'll tell stories about Battles of the Rebellion during his travels, all the stuff he's done. And Ray. Th this will really sort of expand on Ray's fascination with, you know, the Rebellion and that, that sort of era. Where she'll go and she'll listen to all these stories that this man tells. So this isn't just a great way to expand on Ray's character and help develop that. But it's also a great way to introduce the audience to some of this new lore. So, hey... You kind of are wondering, why are there Imperial Walkers here? Why, why does Rey have a Rebellion helmet? Oh, well, you learn about the Battle of Jakku. It's not just something that's like, oh, we'll mention it in, um, in comics, in books, in video games, but not in the movies. Like, oh, no, the Battle of Jakku is actually very significant. Like, oh, no, no, it, 
you'll learn about it in the movie. And along with Ray being a scavenger, she's also going to be basically a part-time taxi driver where she'll essentially ferry people from different things. People who come to Jakku, she'll drive them in her own little ship from place to place. From different For people who come in to scavenge, she'll drive them over to different areas to scavenge or drive them to and from different hubs where they can sell stuff. This will allow her to show that she's a good pilot. You'll have an explanation for, hey, she can actually pilot stuff. So. It's not just like, oh, I've never flown, but here I'm going to be the best pilot the Millennium Falcon has ever seen. No. She's, she's not going to be godlike, like she is in the movie. But I'm going to establish she can actually fly. And she's good at it. We need a pilot. We got one. You. Now, Poe and Finn, likewise, are very similar to how they start off. Poe's main difference which, like I said in my Kylo Ren video, he sticks around in his part of the trio because we were promised it, gosh dang it. But Finn is probably the one that deviates the most heavily, mainly because I actually stick to his backstory. Finn is a stormtrooper, taken as a child, brainwashed, taught to hate Luke Skywalker, hate the Rebellion, hate the Republic, hate Han Solo, hate Princess Leia, hate all the stuff that we know is good, and to only serve the First Order, and to reignite the fires of the Empire. He breaks through this, because, as you'd later find out, he's Force-sensitive, but he doesn't not have blood on his hands. That whole beginning where they're all shooting, he shoots people, and he kills them, because this is what he's trained to do. And I understand what they were going for, but when someone has been trained for most of their life to do this, at least to have him start shooting and then be like, wait, I don't like this. So that's th this is part of the, the title of the movie that I work into the story, The Force Awakens. The Force awakens Finn, the Force awakens Rey, the Force awakens Poe, the Force awakens with Luke. It's like, it actually does mean something. It doesn't feel like, oh, well, there's been an awakening, and be like, oh, what? <laughs> and Finn will still try to escape, but his programming is still going to flare up. Like, when he meets Han Solo, he tries to kill him. When he sees, you know, Aya Solo, Han and Leia's daughter, he tries to kill her. He's been trained to hate these people. He's been brainwashed into being an automated murderer. And it's going to take time to break out of that. And that's what his character arc is going to be. I really hate how they turned him into the, the funny sidekick character in the movies, and it's like, no. If anything, he'd be the most serious, the most stoic. And then over the course of the trilogy, he becomes less stoic, more personable, more funny and charismatic, as he learns to become more human. So by the time you get to episode 9, he is more of a normal person. And then you would compare him back to how he is in The Force Awakens, and it's like, wow, he's so stoic and emotionless in this movie, except for his outbursts of violence. And it's like, oh, and now you see, after he's gone through his character development, oh, so he really is much more of an interesting and likable character now. And that's on purpose. And his friendship with Poe and Rey will also be a very, very strong force in his own character development. Because these are his first two real friends. While he was friends with the other stormtroopers, they were like family to him, the closest that he's known. They were in such a sterile environment, probably even more sterile than what the clones had, that Poe and Ray are these two, you know, genuinely good people who are befriending him, especially Poe. Like, Poe will be like the big brother to everyone in that trio, being like, I need to take care of these children because Ray doesn't know anything except scavenging and flying and then Finn's a brainwashed murderer and he's like, I will take care of you. And like I mentioned in my Kylo Ren video, 
The main villain of the movie will be an adaptation of Thrawn. Introduced in the beginning when Finn is going down to Jakku to go and shoot up a bunch of people, you'll see bits of Thrawn making a speech to the stormtroopers. Overall, the beginning of the movie is going to be fairly similar, at least for the most part. You'll see Rey living her life, you'll see Finn going down and doing the stormtrooper-y things, Poe will still be on the mission to find Luke Skywalker. A few details to add in on this. Luke disappeared five years before the start of The Force Awakens. No one knows where he went, only that he made it clear to Han and Leia that he had important stuff to do, and he disappeared. I'll get into the reasons why at the end of the video, because at the end of the movie, Luke actually gets to speak, and he'll explain a few things. So Han decided to take the Falcon and go out and try to find him, while Leia was trying to maneuver around politically to try to take care of the First Order. The First Order is known, but the Republic has difficulty doing anything because, of course, bureaucratic red tape. Thrawn's smart, so he's got this whole front for the First Order, the Oh, well, we're just helping victims of the Empire. You know, we're, we're not doing anything bad. We do charity work. Look at all the people that we help. And it all looks really nice up front. And then it kind of makes Leia look a little crazy, like, Hey, this guy's basically Palpatine 2.0. And everyone, some other people are like, oh, Well, why should we believe that? So even if Leia is respected, you've got a new generation of, you know, some younger people in the Senate who may not have really understood just how bad things in the Empire were. You've got the old guard. The old guard's like, um, yeah, this sounds pretty sketchy. Yeah, but you've also got some skeevy politicians who Thrawn is paying off and manipulating and threatening and blackmailing, doing all sorts of stuff behind the scenes in order to make it as difficult as possible for the Senate to make any kind of move on the First Order. Politics will be involved, and for people worried about that, truly, it's not going to be that invasive to the story. It's really going to be important to the setup. And it's really important in establishing Thrawn's intelligence because he is playing everything and this is how the First Order 1 has managed to operate in secrecy for so long and 2, how he's getting his funding. Because he's making all these deals with people saying, oh, uh, so you're probably going to take over, uh, we'll fund you as long as you give us a nice piece of the pie when you're done. So you've got some people who may be easily swayed by the promise of a new empire, and some people who may be just scared and are, instead of fighting back, are just cowering down. And then you've got some people who are just skeevy politicians who think that this is just a good way to move ahead in their careers. Nothing's always black and white. So Leia has been working in this and trying to figure out, okay, we need to find a way to stop these people. Because they know that, you know, groups of children have been disappearing over the years. And this is what really alerted Han, Luke, and Leia that the First Order existed. And they're like, well, you know, they're, all these, these places are being attacked, destroyed, but then all the children are being taken. Of course, those children have become the new stormtroopers. So Han, Luke, and Leia, years ago, figured out, we gotta do something. So, of course, the Senate spends years trying to debate, should we do something? We should do something. Should we do something? We should do something. And nothing really gets done. So Han, Luke, and Leia start their own smaller group with a bunch of people who are loyal to them to try to figure out what's going on and put a stop to it. That is the group that Poe's involved with. They wouldn't be called the Resistance. I don't actually have a name for them yet, but it's not going to be something as generic as the Resistance. And a few years prior to the start of The Force Awakens, the Millennium Falcon was stolen from Han. So Han is like, uh, okay, I'm going, I need to find Luke. So this is really showing Han's character that when he loses the Falcon, his priority is still to find Luke. And this is the point where they also are like, okay, we need 
to send more people out. So this is why Poe is also sent out to find Luke. So Han and Leia's eldest child, Aya Solo, I talked a little bit about her in the previous video, but a quick recap. She's essentially the equivalent to Jaina Solo. She's going to be the main Jedi in the movie. She and Chewie went out to find the Falcon, while Han and Poe are out tracking down clues to find Luke, while Leia is out leading their group to figure out what to do about the First Order, and also dealing with the political side of things. When Ray, Finn, and Poe are escaping and they get onto the Millennium Falcon, Aya and Chewie are actually on the Falcon trying to get it fixed up so they can just steal it, because they're not going to ask questions, and they don't care who owns it now. They're stealing it. <laughs> so they're on the Falcon when they when Ray uh, takes off. The thing is, Poe's like, bro, I grew up on this ship. My parents were friends with the Skywalker Solo family. So while Ray is starting to crash this ship around, he gets in the pilot seat and he pilots it because he's the best pilot they have. So he's the one who pulls off some of these cool maneuvers, not Ray. Ray and Finn are taking care of other stuff and they're flying around and escape. And then that's when Aya and Chewie pop up and they're like, hey, hands up, give us the ship back. <laughs> and then Aya recognizes Poe. He's like, hey, I got a clue to your uncle. And she's like, oh, you found something on Luke. Because very early on in the movie, Poe gets a clue from the old man. The same old man who is telling these stories to Ray that I was talking about earlier. You get a little bit more about this guy. This guy was someone who was actually involved in the rebellion way back in the day. So he's someone who knew Han, Luke, and Leia. He lived on Jakku and he had found this clue to Luke Skywalker and that's when he contacted you know, Leia and then she sent Poe. And then that's how that whole thing ends up starting. Now this this clue isn't a map, at least not a conventional one. This is something that always kind of annoyed me. It's just oh, it's just a map. No, it's it's something else. It's it's an indecipherable map. No one knows what the hell it is, but they'll have to figure it out. So yeah, Luke was like, I'm not gonna make it that easy, because he did not want to be found, at least not until he was ready. And I'll end up talking about that a little bit later when I get around to the Luke part and he'll start answering questions. So you've got some similar stuff like going and meeting Maz Kanata. That stuff does happen and she does have Luke's lightsaber. But unlike the movie, there's an explanation for it. Maz Kanata was an old friend of Jedi's long ago. She actually knew Yoda because she's a being that's hundreds and hundreds of years old, so she knew Yoda. And after Order 66, what she did was she went around in trying to find and collect and preserve all of the lightsabers of the fallen Jedi. And this was very helpful for Luke when he was trying to restart his Jedi Order. What he did is he took um, all these lightsabers and he put them in a, a a section of the Jedi Temple because Luke started his new Jedi Order in the Coruscant Jedi Temple and he dedicated a part of it to showing off all the lightsabers of all of the previous Jedi who had fallen and as many as he could find and collect. The Empire did destroy some of these and did harvest their kyber crystals but he did the best he could to preserve this and to sort of preserve history of the Jedi, of the previous Jedi Order. So Maz Kanata did help Luke with this, so they ended up becoming friends. Now, some years after Return of the Jedi, Lando shows up to Luke and he's like, Hey Luke, we found this in the trash in Cloud City. He pulls out the old lightsaber. And so then Luke ended up starting a bit of a tradition so that that lightsaber became the first real lightsaber that each of his and Leia's kids would use before they built their own lightsabers. It's a little bit of a tradition that eventually, you know, his son, Ben Skywalker, he used it. Aya Solo, she used it. Bale Solo, he used it. 
Anakin Solo, he used it. So before Luke disappeared, he went to Maz Kanata and he left the lightsaber in her care, feeling it was the will of the Force. So Rey finds the lightsaber, and this is when Maz Kanata kind of starts piecing things together and she's like, you having this lightsaber, this is the will of the Force. This is what's meant to be. And she's like, why? And Maz is, Maz is starting to piece a few things together, but there are little hints here and there to Rey's identity. But it won't be answered until the very end. But Maz doesn't really say anything. She just gives her the lightsaber and says, this lightsaber, this was Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber. Then it was Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. And now it's yours. I'm sure the identity of Rey is becoming very obvious. But mystery boxes, mystery boxes! Can't answer everything immediately. But unlike J.J. Abrams, I will answer them. So Rey will have this lightsaber and be clumsy as hell with it. She won't know what the hell she's doing. Aya Solo will be like, Yo, hey, I remember that lightsaber. I trained with that when I was younger. Being all nostalgic, and this is, and she'll sort of explain a few things of what I said about, you know, the kids using that lightsaber to train at first before they built their own. But so using Aya Solo is a way to sort of explain a few things to, to give you a better picture of the 30 year gap. And if you want a complete full picture, this is what books and video games and comics and stuff are for to fill that out. But like I talked about with Kylo Ren's backstory. You will learn about this in the movies, but the true full expansion of all the details, that'll be stuff for expanded materials. But the important stuff, the stuff that you need to understand, it's in the movies. It's kind of important. And the First Order still attacks Maz's place, doesn't completely obliterate it, but they do attack it. And this is where Han and Leia come in with their group and their own, you know, new rebellion. And then they come fighting back. So this is where Han and Leia first show up. Of course, still together, still happily married, and neither of them have been ruined. They have a nice little reunion with their daughter, Aya. So then you'll also get some hints about, oh, Bail Solo and Ben Skywalker. So you'll, you'll, you'll hear about that, and I'm sure a lot of people will just be like, oh my gosh, yes, when you start hearing, you know, names like Ben Skywalker. So Han and Leia will have a relatively small part. You'll see Leia throughout the movie doing her politicking and leading, and you'll see Han sort of doing his thing and helping out. But they'll be supporting characters. They'll still be important, and th this, is, this is the main thing. They're still important. They haven't been pushed aside, and they're still doing things that have a great effect on the story, but the main focus is on these new characters who are basically serving under the old characters, because they're the old guard, they're the wise leaders now. And while they may not be the main focus, because I do agree the idea of having new characters be the main focus, you can't forget the old characters and you can't brush them aside, because these are the characters that generations of people have cared about. So this is showing, yeah, they may not be the main focus now like they were in the original trilogy, but they're still really important. They're revered figures because of what they did in the original trilogy. And Rey will basically idol worship these because she's heard stories from that old man uh, you know, about these these great heroes, and she's just like, oh my gosh, you're on Solo, and oh my gosh, you're Princess Leia. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. So this is a little fun little thing with Rey that she's just this kind of a giddy fangirl with them. And then Finn's just like, Han Solo, I want to kill you, and then they have to stop him, and then he's just like, Ugh, because that's, that's Finn's programming. Yeah, he's been programmed to kill these people. He hates them. And now he has to realize everything he's ever learned was wrong. His hatred of Luke Skywalker is wrong and he's struggling with this because he has this feeling deep in his heart, this what I did was wrong, but he's turning against everything that he had believed in and it wrecks him. And another detail, 
Very important detail. Finn refuses to kill a single stormtrooper. Now, this is something that Han, Luke, and Leia, once they figured out what the stormtroopers were, they basically made it a point to try to kill as few of them as possible. Their end goal is to try to rescue them. This is something that Finn ends up helping out with because Finn was on the inside. Finn knows what it was like, knows what they went through. And Finn refuses to even hurt a single stormtrooper because he can recognize them. He knows just from the way they're moving in the battlefield who that is. And these are his brothers and sisters. These are the people that he grew up with. So the, the thought of seeing any of them hurt actually does hurt him. So this is also going to be part of his character arc because I really hate the fact that he's just shooting stormtroopers in the movie. Just like it doesn't even matter. And like I mentioned in my previous video, there is a fight between Aya Solo and Kylo Ren and it's during the fight at Maz's Cantina. So you get this awesome lightsaber fight because you need a proper lightsaber fight in a Star Wars movie. And you get a couple of them in the movie. And another thing to talk about is... Um, in, in The Force Awakens, Kylo Ren makes it clear that he recognizes the reference to a girl. The reason that is in this version of the story is because Thrawn wants Rey. And he wants her alive. He doesn't want her hurt. At least, not much. But he wants to use her. He wants to indoctrinate her into the Knights of Ren. This is an important detail. Keep it in mind for later. And since I'm talking about the villains here, I should talk a little bit about Hux and Phasma. Both are still in the movie. General Hux is still a primary leader. He was the son of an Imperial officer who worked with Thrawn. This nepotism explains how he became a general so young. He pleads himself as loyal to the First Order and is a tactical genius. So he's been a very good asset to Thrawn. Phasma, likewise, is still the leader of the Stormtroopers. Only this time, she'll actually have a character. She'll get to do stuff. She'll actually get to fight. You'll see her interact with Hux and Kylo Ren, and even Thrawn. And you'll actually get to see a detail of her character that was in the Expanded Universe, but never brought up in the movies, is the fact that She's kind of an obsessive Palpatine fangirl. Even like her armor was made from the hull of Palpatine's Naboo Senator Cruiser. And it's like, that's such a cool detail. Why not bring it up? Actually give her more character. So you actually see her having a very close friendship with Hux. And because, you know, they, they work together quite a bit being the main leaders of their military force and, and having a very amicable relationship. Not so much with Kylo Ren. There's some tension between them and Kylo Ren because Kylo Ren, oh, he's like the pet lap dog for Thrawn. And as loyal as they are, they're, they still don't particularly like him all that much. And like what a lot of people have suggested over the years, Phasma will actually get to fight Finn, and you'll get to see her and his conflict throughout the trilogy. You will see her being a very pissed off commander, you know, essentially chasing the soldier that went AWOL. The First Order will still have Starkiller Base. However, however, it's not a Death Star. Not at all. It's much, much smaller than the Death Star still disguised with the whole snowy planet but it's not a weapon it was intended to be because it was actually part of the whole Death Star plans that Palpatine had going decades earlier it was intended to be another Death Star essentially what Palpatine wanted was to have multiple Death Stars that he can employ at any point he wanted so that anyone at anywhere in the galaxy that stood against him, psh, boom, planet gone. Or, as Rogue One showed us, even just a fraction of that power could level a city. He could go, psh, city's gone, alright? 
If you want your planet to stick around, bow to the Empire. But when the first Death Star was destroyed in A New Hope, Palpatine then had all these other resources that were going to other Death Stars, like Starkiller Base, moving them to the Death Star that you see in Return of the Jedi. Because Palpatine really wanted that Death Star. So, other stuff like Starkiller Base was left unfinished. Thrawn found this, along with other uh, money and resources that he took from the remnants of the Empire. So other like generals and admirals and stuff like that, all these people had, he'd either manipulate them into giving it to him, or he'd kill them and take it. One of these things he found was Starkiller Base. It wasn't finished, so Thrawn had to finish it, and he turns that into a base of operations for them. Eventually, he was hoping to turn it into another Death Star, so that he could have that power on his side, but he doesn't have that. It's just their main base of operations. Finn knows about Starkiller Base, so he works with the good guys to try to take it out. He makes it clear that this isn't the only base of operations the First Order has. Thrawn isn't stupid enough to put his eggs in one basket. He's not going to repeat the mistakes that Palpatine and Grand Moff Tarkin made all those decades ago. He's got his eggs spread around, so even taking out Starkiller Base isn't going to stop him. It's just going to take out a, a main base of operations that they have. But they want to take that out, because then that will severely weaken the First Order. Now, throughout the movie, Aya helps Rey with some Jedi training. Kind of like what Obi-Wan did with Luke in A New Hope. She'll be teaching her some stuff, so in between some of the, the major parts of the story, You'll see her on the Falcon with Rey helping her train, you know, help teaching her about the Force, or giving a little exposition about talking about her family, and I think she recognizes Rey. Something about her seems familiar. Keep that in mind. It's going to come up later. So Rey will have some skills. She's obviously very Force-sensitive. She's got some sort of talent with a lightsaber. And Aya kind of helps her learn some stuff more than just basic pew, pew, like what younglings learn. And even when Rey ends up picking up the lightsaber to fight Kylo Ren, she still gets her butt handed to her. She needs Bail Solo to bail her out. But that'll come a little bit later. I talked about this in my Kylo Ren video, but... Poe and Kylo Ren are brothers. This is going to be Poe's main storyline and his main tie to the actual main plot. He wants to rescue his brother from the dark side. Kind of like how Luke wanted to rescue Vader from the dark side in Return of the Jedi. And if you want more details on that, you can check out my Kylo Ren video. So, like in the movie, they go and they end up going to destroy Starkiller Base... Only this time, the reason that the shields get turned off is because it seems like someone on the inside did it. This is something that would come up later in the trilogy, and I'm not going to spoil who did it. Because that actually is kind of a fun reveal. So they all gather together, and they, they plan their thing with all the other people, and you got your Akbar cameo, then you've got Leia and Han, they're, they're going in and working in, and Han doesn't die, that was stupid. They all live. And like I talked about in my Kylo Ren video, the bridge scene with Kylo Ren still happens, but it happens with Poe. Rey will be on the inside going in and helping take things down on the inside, take it easier for the rest of, you know, the new rebellion to come in and attack it. Finn's knowledge of Starkiller Base, not because he's a janitor, just because he's part of the military, does come in great help when it comes to them attacking Starkiller Base. And like in The Force Awakens movie, you end up having a confrontation between Finn and Rey and Kylo. They've got Luke's old lightsaber, and they're trying to use it, and they fail. Kylo Ren effortlessly defeats both of them. And then, this is when Bail Solo shows up, flying in to dramatically save the day. So this is when you get the big final lightsaber fight of the movie between Kylo Ren and Bail Solo. Bail knows Kylo Ren because the Dameron family were friends with the Skywalker Solo family because 
Poe and Kylo's parents were friends with Han, Luke, and Leia. So, Bale knows Kylo. So this makes this fight a little bit personal for them. But you also get to see a really cool fight between these two in the snowy area. Not the complete mess that the fight we got in the movie was. An actual lightsaber fight that I would hope would be on par with the fights in the prequels. And then this is when Han flies the Falcon in and he rescues everyone and then they all end up you know, escaping and getting off. And then Kylo Ren gets picked up by Hux and then they, they all fly off. And Thrawn, being a practical villain, has them all evacuate Starkiller Base once he realizes that things are going south. So that he doesn't lose a crap ton of men along with the base. So at the end you've got Thrawn realizing, hmm, okay, so that didn't go well. So this is when he needs to call in the rest of the Knights of Ren. So then they would come in for Episode 8. So with them having victory at the destruction of Starkiller Base, what's been going on is actually giving Leia a little bit more uh, leverage to use in the debates in the Senate to get them to take more action because the First Order is actually a serious problem and they don't know how many other bases that they have. Thrawn compartmentalized a lot of that stuff because he's not going to have every single foot soldier know everything. So Leia's urging them to take action to actually deal with the First Order, especially now that they have Finn to give some testimony on this. So after they destroy Starkiller Base, they, they finally get a chance to properly look over this clue, and it's some sort of weird star map, but they can't quite decipher it. It's not an actual real map. It seems almost random. Until Leia, Aya, and Bale realize something. Like, wait a minute. This is something Luke talked about. And they realize that it was a message written in this obscure ancient language that Luke had told them about. So they managed to decipher it and find an actual, like, destination for this. And this is what leads them to Ak 2. So it's something that only his family would know. No one else would know this language unless you have know the handful of people in the galaxy who even know about this ancient language. Luke's done his research, and he put it to good use. So, like at the end of the Force Awakens movie, Rey will go to meet Luke Skywalker and to give him that lightsaber. Here's the difference. Han and Leia go with her, along with Chewie. I mean, of course they do. Leia wants to go see her brother that she hasn't seen in five years. Han wants to go see his best friend. Chewie, Chewie wants to see Luke too. <laughs> now, a detail that it's important that I should bring up before I get into the Luke stuff at the end. Luke will be shown part way through the movie saying something vague about how there's been an awakening in the Force and that he needs to be ready. What? What for? Well, you find out at the end of the movie. Now, when Rey goes and meets with Luke, she hands him the lightsaber, and he looks at her, and he smiles, and he holds the lightsaber, and he kind of takes it from her, and he takes her hand, and he pulls her in for a hug, and she's just like, it's Luke Skywalker, he's hugging me, and then Luke says, hello, Rey, and she's like, how do you know my name? And he's like, I think I'd know the name of my daughter. And she'd be like, what? And he says, Ray, I am your father. A little cheeky, but it's like poetry. It rhymes. And we'll be confused, being like, wait, you're, you're my father? And Luke's like, yes. I trained you as a Jedi when you were a little girl. And then you were taken. So then this brings the obvious question of, what the hell happened that she needed upon Jakku? You'll end up finding more about this in, you know, episode 8. But Luke gives his side of the story. What happened is that, you know, some years ago, the Jedi Temple 
was attacked. A bunch of essentially proto stormtroopers at the time, along with Kylo Ren and members of the Knights of Ren, they attacked. They were meaning to wipe out the Jedi with overwhelming force in the middle of the night. Didn't succeed. They killed some Jedi, but Luke managed to get the rest of them out. So when there's talk in the movie of, oh, well, Luke's Jedi Order disappeared, they did disappear onto Ak-2 in the location of a very early Jedi Temple. This is where Luke took the rest of the Jedi, the, the Padawans that he was helping train, the younglings that he had there, and even some of the Jedi Masters, which include people like Ahsoka. So, yes, you would actually see Ahsoka in the movies, in old, a much older Ahsoka, but she's another master working in Luke's, you know, new order. You'll, feel, you'll have another couple characters that people are probably going to be really excited about. I'd include characters like Kanan and Ezra. Because, I mean, I, I did like Rebels, and if, Rebels ended up getting really bad. I mean, and if I had my way, Rebels would have gone in a way that much closer, you know, tied into the actual canon story. So then you'll see an adult, you know, Ezra, and then a much older Kanan. And a name will be brought up that I'm sure a lot of people will be happy to hear. Kyle Katarn. Yes, there's going to be some pretty significant fan service in this. Because, yeah, those are other masters in Luke's New Order. Now, when the Jedi Temple was attacked, they tried to take the younglings. They only succeeded in grabbing one, a young Rey Skywalker. And what would eventually be revealed once you start finding out more about her backstory in Episode 8 was that she was taken by the First Order, brainwashed so that she forgot everything. And what Thrawn wanted to do was to indoctrinate her into the Knights of Ren. That's like I said earlier. Except he wanted to do this to her as a child. Train her from, you know, being just a kid into being a Knight of Ren and do what he did with the Stormtroopers have them brainwashed and programmed to serve him and the Empire. Unfortunately for him, there was a First Order officer involved in this that felt really guilty about kidnapping and brainwashing this child. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to escape with her, get her out of here. So he grabbed her and he escaped. He flew away. The ship got damaged because they were trying to hunt him down. He ended up crashing on Jakku. He ended up dying from his injuries, leaving a young Rey there with a still very blurry memory because she, she had just been brainwashed. She still didn't really know what was going on. So then she's left on Jakku, having to learn how to fend for herself. She did end up meeting some people who did help sort of raise her, but she didn't really have any memories of anything before that. So she didn't even know how she got there because she 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 got out of the of the ship and she just started walking. So that that ship eventually it was stripped by scavengers and no one really knew where it came from. All Ray could remember was the name Ray. She didn't know why. But she just kind of thought, I guess it's my name. So everyone had assumed that Rey Skywalker was dead. Killed in the attack. But no. She was alive. But because of her brainwashing, it screwed with her connection to the Force. So it made it very difficult for Luke to track her down. But once she was awakened, then Luke was able to properly sense her again. And then that's when he was wanting to get ready, because he was getting ready for her to come and find him. So Luke explains a lot of the stuff that had been happening, and what he's been doing for those past five years. What he was doing, he was going and looking into things in the First Order on his own. 
he figured out that Thrawn had a specific hatred for him. He hates all of them, but there was a very specific focused hatred on Luke Skywalker, and Luke realized this. So, as he's done before, he wanted to separate himself from everyone so that he can draw the attention onto himself. And using the Force to mostly mask his presence, he's able to remain hidden on Ahch 2, using the Force to essentially act as a barrier. They don't know where it is, it doesn't really come up in the Force, so if someone like Kylo was trying to find him, they couldn't find him. Because the planet is very strong in the Force. So when Luke would want to go in and strike and do something against the First Order, he could do it when and where he wanted, and do things that he could he knows would help Leia and Han, but doing things in a way that wouldn't put any extra heat on them. But there's another nice little thing here. Luke asks Rey if she'd like to meet her mother. And then Rey's just like, my mother? And she's overjoyed. And you turn to see an older Mara Jade. She's there, and she's been going out and doing this stuff with Luke, because when he ran off, she's just like, ah, pfft, no, uh, you're not going without me. Till death do us part, and neither of us are dead. So they, <laughs> she was going out with him, and was with him this whole time. There would be some references to her, but nothing super, like, obvious, until you get to the end of the movie, and you see her there on Octu with Luke and just blow people's mind. People would be losing it in the theaters. Because, holy crap, yes, this is what I talk about when I'd say I'd bring in a few things from the old EU. I would, like, I brought in an, an adaptation. I, I'd change him up as a character. But I bring in Thrawn. And I bring in Mara Jade. So Rey gets to meet her mother, Mara Jade. And... Ray is overwhelmed. Now she has a family. And then this also really sort of puts in new context on her interactions with Aya and Bale. Those are her cousins. That's her family. So Ray goes from having no family for her, at least the life she can remember, to having a bunch of family a dad, a mom. She's got brothers, she's got cousins, and it's like, and it's overwhelming for her. It overjoys her, and it's, it's really heartwarming. And then Luke says that he can train her to become a Jedi. And so then she accepts, and you, you've got your reunion with Han, Luke, and Leia, and they're meeting her up with Mara, and it's, it's really nice and heartwarming. And then that's the, them on Octu is the last thing you see before it, it, the movie ends and the credits roll. And it just, it, it would be really heartwarming to end on that note. Not this really obscure note. And here's the thing with Mystery Boxes, J.J. Abram. You set up a mystery, you answer it. Because people like the mystery, but they also like getting answers. Why do you think so many people were pissed off at the end of Lost? You set up mysteries, and at the end you're like, Whoa, we don't have any answers. Mystery boxes only work when you can open them and find something inside. And that's what I would do in the movie. You set up some mysteries. And I'm sure, from what I was saying earlier, it was obvious that Rey was Luke's daughter. Because people had predicted that before the movie even came out, the second we got our first production still of Rey, everyone's like, oh, so she's Luke's daughter. And it's the Skywalker Saga, so you would think, duh, naturally. But yeah, I'd get that answered at the end of The Force Awakens. No one need to drag that out, because then there's still more stuff to explore with Rey, and to see her do her training. And then, of course, the next movie would have time skipped, and she's been doing her training with Luke, and the rest of some of the other Jedi Masters. And as I mentioned... Finn is also Force-sensitive, and he will eventually get training, and he'll be personally taught by Kyle Katarn. Another guy who's like, hey, Stormtrooper turned Jedi, right? Hey. So you'll get a lot of wonderful interactions with those characters. Another thing to talk about for throughout the movie is the reference to the Force Ghosts. It'll be kind of funny because you'll see Aya talk to a Force Ghost, like Obi-Wan and Anakin, but... 
the other characters can't see them. Which is which is a really funny part. They start to appear in episode eight when Ray can start to see them, and then she's sitting there like, "Holy crap! What are these ghost people?" <laughs> So she'll get to meet her grandfather, Anakin, and I would absolutely bring Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen back, and I'd love to get Liam Neeson back as Qui-Gon, and have him make an appearance, too. And it's a way to really sort of tie in elements of the original trilogy and the prequels to not just focus on stuff from the original trilogy, but to also incorporate all of what happened in the original six movies that Lucas did. That way it feels like an actual true continuation and it's not just no we're only going to focus on the original trilogy because we're trying to pander to a very specific sect of the fandom. It's no. This is a sequel. It's a sequel to six previous movies and it will reference these movies. I even had this great idea of Leia talking to the current Queen of Naboo in a very short scene in the, near the beginning of the movie. Just as a nice little nod to, oh, hey, it's the, the current queen of Naboo. It shows that Leia is connecting to her mother's past. Because you see her go to Naboo in the comics. So it's like, oh, no, it's like, no, she's still in contact with them. And is friends with the current royalty. A little nice stuff. And from there, you have a lot that's set up that you can continue on. Especially with developing the other Knights of Ren. I actually had one knight in particular that I would was planning to develop as another sort of rival within the Knights of Ren for Kylo Ren, but that's that's extra stuff that goes on in the other two movies. My ideas with this was to take the the core concepts and ideas that were in The Force Awakens because some core ideas, some base ideas, some character ideas, they were good. The execution was absolutely abysmal. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to take this stuff and execute it in a way that's respectful to the previous movies and it's not just like, lol, we destroyed the Republic. Oh, well, thanks for taking everything Leia, Han, and Luke worked so hard for and just destroying it. Thank you. But it's like, no, it, it respects it and it builds a platform basically to expand on in the future. There's plenty to work on with an episode 8 and an episode 9. There's plenty of stuff that's been introduced that would get people interested in checking out the expanded universe. So hey, you want to see what happened between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens? Well, we've already introduced a number of these elements to you, so now you can read up and find out more about that. And there's all sorts of other stuff that you can do and expand on. And I think overall it would be a much more satisfying movie. Now what I gave wasn't a full explanation of everything in the movie because frankly that would take hours going through and explaining all of the little details and the stuff in the movie. I did that for my Ruby rewrite and that video was longer. <laughs> I think that bringing in things like Thrawn and Mara Jade and, you know, characters like Ben Skywalker, and having some of that stuff from the old you that a lot of people loved will really sort of get a lot of people who felt disappointed that the EU was relegated to its own section of canon. Like, okay, so while the EU as a whole was relegated to its own section of canon, we're bringing in some of the best parts and actually incorporating that into proper canon. And I think this would gen genuinely be a much, much better movie, much more satisfying for fans and general audiences alike. So yeah, I think that's about it for this topic. If you want to submit a topic to me, you can either comment below if you're on YouTube or if you're on Tumblr, you can send me an ask, put topic colon, then whatever topic you want me to talk about. Or if you're on the Discord, you can go into the topic submissions channel and submit a topic you want me to talk about. Just make sure to follow the rules that I'll be posting down below. If you want to watch last week's topic video, you can check that out here. If you want to watch next week's topic video, you can check that out here when I get that done. So what are your thoughts on my rewrite? Do you like them? Do you have your own ideas? Please comment below. And thank you for watching.